just kind of. So thank Meeting you very much. Being recorded, everybody. Exactly. Yeah. So best behavior, everybody. So yeah. welcome to this uh, tech talk with uh, David Tish. And uh, to get into things, I'm going to kind of start at the more at the beginning of your career and then and then work forward. So, you know, you went to NYU Law and interned in, in a law firm and then dabbled a little bit in a real estate firm and ended up with startups and investing. So what led you uh, along that path? What was the what was the common thread along all these uh, endeavors? Yeah, I, I think it's a different moment in time, right? 2006, graduating law school, the internet's basically dead. Um, the dot-com bust had happened and the idea of, of building a career around the internet was just not something you were naturally exposed to in, in school. I think today, um, you know, you're taught about uh, startups, you're taught about tech companies. It's like a natural path. Venture capital is a word that I probably learned, I don't know, like three years after law school, it just was such a foreign concept. So the idea of understanding that that was a career that was accessible or possible, um, it just, it just wasn't something I understood. And so uh, I think more than anything, I was figuring out what I wanted to be um, and wandering through that path. Um, law school is a, uh, a it, like you're told to go, like it, it's a vocational school, right? You're trained to be a lawyer, but I think a lot of people go with the intention of not being a lawyer, which is, is a trick because you leave law school and you're suddenly a lawyer, which is not the goal um, for most people other than for lawyers. Um, and so, uh, I think I, you know, connected back to, in essence, what I liked in life, which was the internet. And uh, I grew up spending most of my time on the internet. That's one of the first hundred power sellers on eBay, buying and selling baseball cards. Uh, I made friends on the internet at like age 10 and 11 and 12, when it was like totally bizarre to make friends online today. That's obviously normal. You know, back then it wasn't. Um, and uh, I think for uh, me, it was probably 2006 when I started to see uh, the New York startup ecosystem begin to happen. And uh, there was, you know, at the time, a Google office in New York, uh, Facebook had sort of just gotten started up in Boston. And uh, there were some startups happening in New York. Um, and I said, man, maybe this is going to happen here. And I sort of quit uh, the real world and, and dabbled into this. And I don't know, we're like 14 years later, here we are. Yeah, it must have been an incredible time to be alive when, you know, this whole new right industry was the economy completely collapsed. taken over. Incredibly exciting. Yeah, that must have been, I'm, I'm almost jealous that I wasn't, I was, I'm a little bit late coming into it. Like we're an in internet like 3.0 now. Would have been great to be there when everything was just, taken off and completely changing and nobody knew where it was going to go. Um, I guess kind of like people say it's happening at the moment with like blockchain and I guess artificial intelligence to some set, to some extent. Um, and so did that kind of journey into venture capital begin in 2007 when you founded Vox Group? Um, yeah. So Vox Group, um, you know, we're, we're early stage tech in, uh, investors. We've been investing in our early stage companies uh, since mainly 2009. I started a company before that and sold it to a big company uh, where I worked for two years uh, running their R&D labs. It's a company called Info and XX. Uh, it's still around. Uh, it's not, not an exciting company. I'm probably not legally allowed to say that, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it's sort of like a dead VC company where they're, they've been around forever, but I don't know what the prospects are. Um, and um, left there and, and ended up doing more investing at a box group uh, and started Techstars at the same time. And so I worked at Techstars for three years, started and ran the program in New York here. Uh, we incubated 36 companies while I was there. Uh, and box group was sort of my side uh, way of investing in, in companies, both inside and outside of the Techstars ecosystem. Uh, left in, in 2012 to do box group full time. So box group uh, for the past nine years um, has been what I do full time. We're a team of six. Uh, five of us are based in New York, one of us in San Francisco. Uh, we've made about 350 investments over the past um, basically 11 years. Yeah, wow. It's some um, fantastic companies as well who've done outstandingly well. Um, and just 
double clicking a little bit on, on Techstars, what was the process like that for, uh, you know, founding it? Because it's like one of the best known accelerators, I would say, in the world um, now. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, again, it, it's a different era, right? There's um, in New York at the time, 20, 2009, there's just, there's a lot of activity, but nobody has sort of brought this community together. There are some startups that are uh, getting off the ground, taking off, but uh, the community really was uh, nascent at the time. And uh, Y Combinator had, had just moved from Boston to San Francisco. Uh, Techstars was uh, live in two cities, in Boulder, Colorado, where it started, and in Boston. Um, and it, it was confusing to me why nothing had sort of happened in New York. There was a, um, a, a gap in the market. And so I uh, ended up meeting and getting to know the founder of Techstars, David Cohen, and um, pretty quickly uh, built a great relationship there and uh, took charge of launching and running the program in New York. So we were the third program uh, at a Techstars, pretty quickly became sort of the biggest and loudest version of uh, Techstars. And um, when I left uh, three years later, um, you know, there were a lot more programs and, and sort of a different vision than uh, trying to build um, something small and, and uh, early. And so, um, you know, I, I think more than anything, it was a moment in time when uh, the community needed that and it needed somebody, uh, an organization to come in and sort of bring everybody together. And there's a lot of people from uh, all the way back, you know, 10, 11 years ago that are uh, still the leaders of, of this community today that were uh, really just emerging and, and finding their way into it back then. Yeah, very interesting. I didn't realize that Techstars, you know, started in, in Boulder and, and Y Combinator started in uh, Boston, which is like not where you would most associate them with now, right? So they yeah. kind of, I guess, y saw YC the market was, opportunity. YC was definitely in Boston and, and it definitely is not sort of part of their identity today. No, I, di I didn't, didn't realize that at all. Um, very, very interesting. And you've been investing in, in early stage companies for a while and, you know, choosing obviously who comes into tech stars, et cetera. So what do you, what are you interested or what interested you about working with, with these early stage companies? What, what, what was it that really drew you to this? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it's such a crazy cool job, right? We, we are waking up every day and meeting people who have a dream and uh, we're, we're very early on in, uh, helping support their ability to go and build and fulfill that dream. And I think um, I, I find it to be a very uh, lucky, privileged job where um, we're able to, to be part of someone's uh, story at the very early um, sort of onset of it, right? We, a lot of the time we're getting pitched a company or a product before they've even started building it. And um, our job is to meet people and more than anything, just invest in people. And, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what else I would do. I think that's how I probably uh, think about careers in general is if you can find something that you get to do every day and can't really figure out what else uh, you would wanna do, it's probably a great thing to, to spend your career on. And uh, that's how I feel about what I get to do every day is uh, I, I just don't know what else I would do. So this feels like a great place to, to spend my time. Yeah, I can imagine being around people with amazing visions and obviously a lot of smart people with, with great ideas must be a lot of fun. Um, I'm sure a lot of people here are hoping to emanate your career path or emulate your career path um, at some point in the future. Don't be and a as lawyer well, on the way. That's the only advice. Don't be a lawyer on the way. Well, hopefully the, the well, maybe there are some um, people also studying law as well as their MBA who I as well do not envy. Right. That must be yeah. an incredible workload. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people here also have ideas about companies that they would like to start in the future. What do you look for when you're investing in a startup? What are, what are some things that people should think about? Um, I mean, you have to be building something you wanna, A, like build for a long time and B, be a winner. It's, it's the hardest thing in the world to do. You're, you're rebelling. You're saying, I can do something that nobody else has ever done, or I can do something that a lot of people are doing much better than they can. And that's really hard. And you have to start from scratch. And so what comes with that is just an immense amount of challenges, the team building, the execution of what you're doing, and then the growth and uh, scaling of it. And um, 
so it has to be something that you're willing to see through it. There's, you know, they talk about entrepreneurship as a roller coaster, but it, it is, it's a roller coaster that, um, you know, the downs are not just this like cute little dip on a roller coaster. They're emotional uh, downs and they last for indefinite amounts of time. And so what gets you through all that is this drive and determination that says, this is what I, I have to be doing. And so I think that's first is figure out passion. Is this something that like I am willing and wanting to wake up and, and force uh, to happen? And then um, I think the next thing is like, why you? So like, are you actually capable of building the best version of this? Is if it's not you, it's going to be somebody else and you're going to lose to that other team. And so I think figuring out the why you and why it's not just you, but it's why, why this team. So when we look at a company, we're looking at um, a team. Um, we're looking at, um, uh, you know, market product idea. And really why is this team the best team to work on this idea um, right now? And, and that's really the, the gist of it. All, all great insights. Now I want to dig in a little bit on the, you know, the emotional struggle that is being, being a founder. Do you think that that is something that, you know, especially maybe young people or first time entrepreneurs really underestimate the amount of effort and how draining it's going to be? Um, yes. I mean, there are very few companies that just sort of work and, and magically happen. And, um, everyone else is in that, that fight. And uh, even when it's sort of working a little bit, you know, you can get, you can get punched in the face pretty quickly and suddenly it's not. And that goes all the way through sort of the end. Um, I, I don't think it's about intellectual challenge. I don't think it's about um, sort of strategic or work challenge. I think it's, it's, this embodiment of challenge, which is emotional, physical, mental, it's, it's everything. And um, I think, you know, the best way to under, and it's not to scare people off, right? Startups are fun and cool these days and uh, sort of everybody gets to do a startup. That's the moment we're in, but it is at the end of the day, um, a, a, a rebel move. It, it is not something that uh, gets taken for granted. And I think, if you don't succeed, it's not just about like, okay, shutting it down or, okay, I'm going to sell it to big company. That just doesn't happen that magically. It's about the toll that it takes, right? You have to look inside of yourself and realize, um, you know, in, in essence, um, you know, like, am I going to get over failing? Did I fail? Am I a failure? And I think that those risks are something that are easy to go in um, blinded to uh, at the beginning. But when you're in it, you're like, oh shit, I, I have to actually make this work and see this through. And um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's cool and easy from the outside to start a company today. Um, but I think the sort of day-to-day -day of doing that is uh, in, insanely non-trivial. Definitely. And, and you mentioned uh, before, you know, a few different areas that you look like team, idea, market size, product. Is there anywhere, and you, you kind of doubled down on, on like why you and why now, is that the, like the ultimate criteria in which you're looking for, which kind of overrules other parts, or is it always like a balance between the different package. elements? It's, it's a package, right? We invest in about one out of every hundred startups we see. So if we're putting that sort of, um, package together you know is this one the one out of the hundred that we're most excited about so is this space something we're excited about is this team you know a team we're excited about do we believe that they have a vision a product that we can get behind and are they going to see it through um and we're going to be wrong most of the time we're going to be wrong on we're going to pass on great companies and we're also going to fund companies that don't work so it's um it, it's it's pretty tricky um, and that, um, you know, I don't have a recipe. I think if I had a recipe, I'd be a lot better at, um, my job than I am. Uh, and just, I was listening to a Reed Hoffman podcast and he was saying when he teaches people how to invest, 
it makes him like write out what he should do. And he's like, yeah, I should do that because it's kind of like this process. And I guess it's also an emotional process for you. Like, do you connect with the founders? Like, do you believe in the vision? Um, so having like a, a cookie cutter model um, is, is difficult. And, um, and what, what do you think? Because there's a few firms now which in algorithmically invest in ideas. How do, you, how do you see that? I think it's really stupid. Don't think it'll work? No, it's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. It is, it's like, like I don't know, like, hey, like Sequoia, the, the, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand what their like insight that thinks that, that lets them think that they can figure something else out that like um, is, it, it's not data driven. There's no, there's no correlation to success in starting a, a high growth company and early data. It, and you're also assuming, which is the flaw of any systematized investing at uh, probably the early stage or any, any stage is other than public markets is uh, liquidity and freedom of access to opportunities, right? So the, the assumption in any of these models has to be that you see everything. If I can see every deal, I would assume I can pick better than if I just see a subset of deals. And so these models that are saying where you can pick the best deals, they're not seeing every deal. So it's sort of like, what are you, what's, you, what's feeding your data model and then what are you selecting for? I don't know, I take the under. Yeah, I, I'm also interested in, in, in how those work and how those are gonna turn out in a few work. years. I, it, it, I, haven't, I haven't seen any of the returns um, from them yet, but it, it'll be interesting. I don't think like, anyone has. Five years down the line, once one of the funds is supposed to have completed, then we'll see what they're what they're made of. Um, it's it's and very look, maybe time. that's me being an idiot and saying, okay, I'm not going to get beat by machine, which I, we all might get beat by machines. But I don't know. I uh, I feel very confident that that's not the threat to our business. Interesting. Well, well, we got you recorded saying that, so yeah. in, in five years down the line, yeah. we can. Put that out, um, depending machine, what happens. Let the machine eat, man. Whatever. <laughs> right. um, and you know, to bring it back a little bit to the you know people on this call. I'm sure a lot of people at the moment have, you know, maybe a startup that they're working on. They're in the early stages of. I know the MBA is a lot of people join because they think, okay, I'm going to start a company while I'm doing it, um, and they're currently looking for um, investors. What what advice would you have for how to find that first investor? Um, I mean, look, there's, there's sort of two types of money or three. There's, there's bad money. There's money and good money. Your goal is to find money or good money. You don't want bad money. So what does that mean? Like try to get to know the people that are offering you money. If you don't have any options, you probably have to take whatever you get. But if you have options, your goal is to do the same amount of work as to who you're going to go into business with as they're doing on you. And so the best way to do that is ask people that they've worked with before, uh, specifically companies that just haven't worked very well. Um, you get to sort of learn a lot more about an investor based upon companies that haven't worked than necessarily the ones that have. Um, and I think just trying to do your work. You're, but you're looking for somebody that you want to talk to, um, that you, you want advice from, that you want to sort of build a long relationship with. These relationships last a long time. And so I think it's important to try to uh, go in eyes wide open, knowing that, you know, we're going to be uh, hopefully uh, in business together for a long time. And so I think it's really about uh, finding the investor that you enjoy uh, the opportunity to work with just as much as it is uh, somebody with like a, a specific track record or expertise in your space. Yeah, that's, that's, I think that's great advice. It's kind of like when you're looking for founders, they got to be people that you're, you're kind of married to them without the romantic part. Um, it's, it's going to be a really close relationship. And when people are, you know, like even before you, you can kind of, if you're cherry picking, I assume you're pretty lucky or you just have a fantastic idea and team, but how, how do you get hold of people? Like, how would I get you on the phone? I hopefully don't have to talk to you on the phone. I try not to talk to anybody on the phone. Um, you know, 
The best way is a warm introduction. So, so finding your way in front of somebody through somebody they like and trust. That's, that's the best way. But that's not for everybody, right? Not everybody has a network that's going to be a degree or two degrees of separation from somebody. So you can figure out how to reach somebody, whether that's through a, a platform like Twitter or um, you know, LinkedIn, if, if that's the, the way you choose to do it, um, or you cold email. I think the key though in any of those engagements is like stand out, right? If we get cold emails, which we get all day, to whom it may concern? Well, you should know who it concerns. You should personalize a cold email. You should do all the work ahead of time to try to succeed in whatever it is you're doing. And uh, we've invested in cold emails before. Um, we've invested in people who, who sort of engaged via Twitter or whatever other form, but it's typically not just like, hey, I'd like to get money from you, please. Here's my idea. It has to have a bit more um, substance and, and stand out. And so I think it's how do you be great at um, getting in front of people? And it's, a, it's in whatever you do, right? If you're at a big company and you want to do sales, getting in front of somebody isn't just about, you know, to whom it may concern, we'd like to sell you what we're doing. It, it's it's a, a bit more nuanced than that. It definitely is. So I worked in sales previously, and if you write it to whom it may concern, I'm pretty sure that'll get picked up by the spam filter anyway. Um, maybe take the sales class before people should take the sales class before they before they pencil that or type that email to you. Um, exactly. And a, a lot of other people on this call are going to be looking to go into tech or go into startups. As an investor, you're obviously thinking about the future and where things are going to head. How do you, like, what advice would you have for people who are going to go into small companies hoping that they're going to grow? How can they spot the good ones? Yeah, I think, I think it's an important question. You, you want to take sort of the investor perspective, except that you are only picking one company. So all your equity is going to be in that one company. Um, you really, more than anything, I think, want to look for, um, you know, the team. Is this a team that I am excited to, to sort of go to work with? And uh, do I believe in them? Do I believe in uh, the vision and, and the mission and why we're doing this and how we're going to go about building this company? I think that, that, that um, you know, there are no uh, perfect ways of, of deciding if an early stage company is going to work. Otherwise, again, uh, people would be better at, at their jobs than, than we all are um, as investors. But, you know, if you're backed by Sequoia Capital or uh, Union Square Ventures or um, Andreessen Horowitz, like that's a good sign. It's not a determinant, but it's a good sign. And so the quality of the sort of investors, the quality of the team, the idea you're looking for this, this package, the same way you are uh, as an investor, except you, again, you get one, one shot. Definitely. Great, great, great advice. And just before we, we hand it over for the AMA, one, you know, just one more question. If, you know, if you could, looking back on your career and all of the learnings that you've had, um, not trying to make you sound old or feel old, but, you know, like you have more experience than we do. Um, what, what advice would you give to yourself in your mid to late 20s? Um, I, I think... I'm going to half answer your question. I think the, the career advice that I would lean into is to focus on your strengths and not your weaknesses. So a lot of people will tell you like, here are the areas that you need improvement in. Like, fuck that. Like, what areas are you great at? Find a job that you can be great at those things. And so there, there, this isn't about being an all around athlete. It's about being a star in whatever it is that you want to be a star in. And so if you are a great salesperson, like go into sales. Don't worry about your design skills or your product skills. If, um, if you are, you know, a great charismatic leader, well, lean into that. There just aren't, um, I, I think, a lot of people that go and say, okay, I'm not worried about the things I'm not good at. I'm going to be good at the thing I, I am good at. And um, I think finding a, a job or a career or passion where you can lean into your strengths and not to be told to, to fix your weaknesses um, is important. And then the only other one I would say is like, um, you know, relationships matter. I think it, um, it's, it's a light word to, to throw around these days of like relationships, networking, whatever that is, but like it's real and um, the world's pretty small and you can come back 10 years later and start seeing people that 
Uh, yeah, like two days ago, I, I introduced a guy I went to law school with uh, to a company we invested in to potentially be their general counsel. Like I haven't spoke to that guy in 15 years, like since we graduated law school. And but I liked him in law school, and we had like a good memory of each other. And so just something as simple as that connection likely benefits him. And it potentially benefits me. If I connected one of our companies to a great potential uh, GC, it, it's a win-win. And, and it comes from a relationship that's 15 years old and not sort of uh, babysat. But I think um, you sort of hear this, this word network and you guys are all MBAs. So you're like professional networkers or whatever the fuck you guys do. Um, but it's true. And I think it, it does matter. And the opportunities you get to meet people and stand out and uh, build relationships from um, will, will be valuable for a long time. Fantastic. Two, two, two fabulous pieces of advice um, to, to leave the, the structured questions on. Thank you, David. It's been an absolute pleasure um, speaking to you. And now I'm going to hand over to Amanda, who's going to um, manage the AMA part of this talk. Sweet. Thanks, Joseph. Okay. Um, so now we're going to open it up to a Q&A. Um, like David said, ask them anything, ask them the hard stuff. Um, I will, if you want to use the um, reactions, raise hand, um, really whatever you want. I'll call on you, go off mute um, and have at it. If you're afraid of asking me a question, you can type it and I'll answer it that way too. I'll ask you a question, David. Yeah, I, I wish I, I invested my Burmese money the way you did yours. I just read on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you seem to have the pulse on the hands of the entrepreneurs and really understand them. I, I'm a, a former entrepreneur. I, I had successful and successful ventures and I wish I had someone like you as my VC instead of the kind of people I had <laughs> as investors. Um, David, one, one maybe quasi-professional question is, um, what do you think about investments in, in uh, what I would call hybrid ventures, which are uh, essentially digital and physical investments? Would you, would you look at those or you strictly would focus on, on something that's completely withdrawn from, from the yeah. physical space or uh -huh. a black? I mean, it, it's, it's really opportunistic. So we funded uh, physical brands like Warby Parker or Harry's or Glossier where they're selling products. We funded a company called Blue Apron which sells physical meals. We funded, uh, I'm an investor in Sweet Green, which is a, a great investment and great salad uh, at the same time. Um, and uh, it really is, is about sort of unique, each opportunity. I don't think, um, you know, we have, uh, aggressive restrictions. We funded a micro satellite company called Astranus, which puts, um, you know, satellites up there in, in micro and satellites are uh, different than what you would think is, is micro. But, um, you know, a company like PillPack, uh, one of our early investments, which has exited or uh, Row, which is a, you know, vertically integrated um, primary care platform. Uh, there's physical components of a lot of these businesses. We, we look at business models. And so we're not looking to fund something that isn't venture scalable or venture backable. And I think that's the, the sort of main lens that we evaluate businesses with. All right, Jenna. Hi, thank you so, oh, sorry. There's a... You're good, I can hear okay. you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, so in some of our business classes, we've talked about how uh, often VCs invest in people, not necessarily business ideas. Is this something you have experience with? Do you think you could talk through a bit? Yeah, it's mostly bullshit, but it's like half real. Um, because what they're not telling you is what actually that means, right? Like, do we invest in people? Yeah, all the time. And, and do sometimes those people like change what they're doing along the way? Yes. Um, but we're not like in the business of, oh, you're, you seem like a great person. Here's money. Go get them. The person has to show up with some version of a package. And that package can be a, a person, a team, an idea, a market, a space. And if you are an undergraduate college student with literally nothing to show in your past, nobody's investing in the person. 
They're investing in the person, the idea, what you've probably built to that point, et cetera. Now, if you're three engineers that are leaving Strife and you've each started a company before and uh, the CEO, she was you know, uh, previously at, at Google leading an engineering team, well, maybe I'll invest in people. Right? So if that's the package of people that's in front of me are these three standout star engineers from Stripe, I don't really care about what they're working on as much as I do how great they were that I'm probably willing to take that risk. So I think when you hear the, the statement, I invest in people, it is a people-driven investment. I am looking for the human behind it. I would much rather fund a great person and a shitty idea than a, a bad sort of entrepreneur and an amazing idea. The, the, that second pairing will not work. I'll, 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 like, I'll mentally note that idea and wait for somebody better to come along to work on it and, and fund the better person when it comes along. But um, I would never, uh, like blank check people are either people that I've known and worked with where I'm like, whatever they do, I will back again. And those are sometimes founders that have failed. And those are sometimes founders that have succeeded that we've backed before. Um, and equally, I think it's, it's sort of what you've done in your past or what you're able to show for it. So uh, I think that's the, the way that um, that actually gets applied in, in reality. Uh, Hillary. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. Thanks, David, for, for coming and being here. I am actually interning at Founder Collective, so we I've guys a lot that. and we, yeah. Uh, we talk a lot about being founder aligned, and I'm sure you too. I'm wondering if you could describe that in your own words and talk about a time where you had to make a decision to be founder aligned rather than not, and maybe there was a negative trade-off. Um, I've never used the word founder aligned, so I'm gonna to try to pretend I, I understand it uh, right now. Um, you know, we actually describe ourselves as founder friendly, not founder aligned. Um, it's probably taking it further. Um, I'd rather take the founder side 98% of the time versus an investor side. We don't sit on boards, we don't lead deals. And so we're a little bit different than some other firms. Uh, we just believe in the long run being on the founder side is, is both more like emotionally interesting to us and long-term business aligned to us in that um, it's, you know, the founder isn't always right, but I'd rather uh, sort of die going down with the founder than I would die going down with other VCs. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken up to investors when they've done things I disagree with to founders in the portfolio. And I think that that builds my reputation with the founders we're lucky enough to invest in. And I think that that's probably uh, the best version of, of uh, that question that I, I think I can answer. I don't know. Did I, did I get it? Oh. Yeah, totally. It's helpful perspective. I, I think a lot of VCs talk about how they're, you know, founder friendly or founder aligned and the definitions vary a lot. So it's helpful to get your perspective on it. Yeah, I just don't care about other investors like, and, and their like random decisions to be assholes. I feel like that's not, that's not why I signed up here. I signed up uh, for this job to, to work with people in their dreams. And so uh, typically is just, let's just take their side because um, that's probably more interesting. All right. Thank you so much. Christian, go for it. Hey, David. Hello. Uh, so you guys mentioned crypto before. I am interested in I your did? perspective. Uh, no, the, uh, <laughs> during the discussion before. I am interested in what you think uh, will kind of survive and what will die off in terms of uh, the cryptocurrency market and, and NFTs in particular. Don't go trading on, on this. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a partner, Greg, who's much smarter uh, about crypto than I am. Um, look, there's a lot of people that, that believe in something. And I think it's very silly to underestimate what belief can do. If you look at um, sort of any part of our, our society where there's a group of believers, those things tend to have power. And um, I think the underlying blockchain technology is the most fascinating part, but that's not, I think, what your question's about. Um, you know, and Dogecoin is a, a perfect example of that. The way that the markets work, it's allowed a lot of believers to pump that up in a way that 
intellectually, you probably can't explain or rationalize. But if you go back and you start trying to explain like how society was built and how currency is built and how like gold is the standard, like it's tricky and there's a slippery slope there too. Like religion, slippery slope. Like most things that are not science based are pretty tricky to like explain. And so I think crypto generally falls under this um, umbrella of like, if everyone just sort of accepts it and believes it, it will come. Um, and the governments do nothing to help themselves out of that future, right? They're, they're not like fixing the brokenness of whatever alternative systems you have such that crypto's uh, sort of continuing to build trust. NFTs, um, good and bad, right? You can lose a lot of fucking money if, if you think, you know, every market just goes up and to the right, as we've already seen over the past couple of months, uh, NFTs can, can go out, down as quickly as they can go up. My friend Gary V is launching his NFT project tomorrow. It's totally crazy. Um, I don't know. It seems interesting, but like I own a crypto punk that either makes me an idiot or cool. One of the two. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't have this strong point of view. Um, it's not my space that I tend to spend a lot of time in. I think there's a lot of money to be made in crypto and we're at the very, very early stages of what the blockchain will enable across many industries. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Cool. Um, Jess. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks uh, for doing this talk. It's really interesting. Um, I was just wondering if you have any advice for young founders or young entrepreneurs on how they go about finding advisors and what they should look for when they're, when they're looking to, to find them. Advisors being what? I mean, give me just a little bit more on that word. Um, I guess like mentors or advisors, like when they're starting companies or, or looking to kind of, I guess, expand to their next level of capital. Um, yeah, um, advisors, like try not to make people advisors who want to be advisors. That's like the first rule of advisors is if somebody raises their hand and says, I want to be an advisor, they're probably just looking to steal equity from you. Um, so I would be weary of that. Um, advisor relationships typically can be on a, um, on a vesting schedule with a cliff. So like make sure that they're actually adding value before you give them equity. Um, if you're in a space, right? Like we fund a lot of healthcare companies. Advisors matter in healthcare. If you are doing something that's point of care to a patient, finding a group of people that are scientifically and, and medically established can really benefit your company. If you're doing something in synthetic biology, the, the advisor group around you matters. If you're doing something in consumer software, like, I don't think I've ever seen an advisor matter to a company. Um, SaaS software, like, what would I look for in advisors? You know, people who can open unique doors for potential customers. That's sort of it. Um, so it really depends upon what space you're working in. The best people to me to, to sort of get advice from are, are founders, people who are a stage or two ahead of you. They're going to have experienced the thing you're trying to solve in real time. A lot of the time you can talk to quote advisors and they're like, well, 18 years ago when I was doing this, this is how it went. And it's so irrelevant, right? Like, a, like two years ago is a long time ago in certain markets. If you ask anybody about NFTs, you know, their experience with NFTs three years ago, it's literally like irrelevant. They existed. They're called crypto kitties. Like, but, but, that's not today. And so finding currency and recency in your sort of group around you, I think is very important. Um, and founders love to help other founders. Most founders tend to pay it forward. And um, I, I would sort of try to lean into that versus anybody who, like at Techstars all the time, we would have like people who wanted to, to be around startups. And I just, that was a, a red flag to me of like, just felt like that wasn't what you're looking for. Any investor who wants to be an advisor without investing is a red flag. Like if they, if they have an ability to write a check and they're not writing a check, don't give them equity. Like if you can write a check and you're not, that's, that's your signal right there. So I don't know. Does that rant work? We're good. All right. Thank you. Lauren. 
Hi, thank you so much. This has been really interesting. Um, I'm curious if um, COVID-19 has changed your outlook on any industries or ideas in particular, um, and if there's anything that maybe you are like giving a second look to now that you hadn't considered before. Um, thank you for that question. Um, you know, the, the, the basic easiest answer is that um, in, in, you know, the past year and a half as the world collapsed and people lost their livelihoods and jobs and, and lives and health um, in, a, in a crazy way, it was a huge positive for our industry. Like we're sitting in an industry where, where, which has benefited greatly from the past year and a half, which is emotionally tricky to reconcile. And it's, um, I feel happier that it's this way versus the other way, but it's a daunting sort of position to find yourself in. The outcomes of tech companies have expanded greatly, both in the private and public markets. Um, we've been investors in spaces that have benefited um, from COVID. And these are spaces we've been investing in for you know, seven, eight years now. So if you look at telehealth, that's a perfect example, or uh, e-commerce infrastructure, or just um, any sort of logistics and delivery. Uh, but more than anything, I think what COVID uh, has done is it's um, really made clear that software is eating the world. If you are not a company that is built upon and sort of driven by software, you will die. And somebody who is software enabled or software first will replace you. And that goes into every single industry. You saw the adoption of software escalate rapidly uh, over the past year in places it never had sort of the, the momentum to penetrate. If you go to restaurants, the QR code or the pay at the table or the you know, pay digitally, that is something that no restaurant was willing and, and wanting to enable. Or on the back end of a restaurant, um, you know, how they order their food and how a lot of that is being done. Uh, these are things that, that I think have been forced. But uh, the craziest thing to me, which I continue to say, and nobody's proved me wrong yet. Um, so like the world shut down, like, literally insanity happened over the past year and a half. And I cannot come up with a single net new thing that has come about because of COVID. Like you can talk about mask wearing, but they've been wearing masks in Asia during flu season and cold season and in a respectful way for a long time. You can talk about like you know, mRNA vaccine. Sure, mRNA vaccines have actually been around for a while as well. They just weren't sort of scaled and, and implemented. But I'm talking about like a fundamental net new behavior. Digital concerts would be like a mediocre example of it, but they exist. They just suck. They still sort of suck, but they're like better than they were. So I cannot come up with a single brand new thing that is like in the past year and a half, this was invented because the world shut down which is crazy to think about sort of the scale of the impact of, of what's happened and the lack of, of uh, I would say, just newness that I've seen uh, bubble up. Like sweatpants are still sweatpants, which are great for, for people working at home, but like I, I truly can't come up with a single um, thing that is just brand new. Um, so that's, that's interesting, I don't know, uh, protect. Yeah, got it. Thanks, David, for taking my question. So uh, I want to understand, like, what is your uh, what is your thesis right now? You spoke a little bit about it in, in the post-COVID times. So it's like all around digital. But if you could expand a little more on, on uh, what your thesis right now is, what kind of companies you are targeting? We're generalists. Um, we fund anything. We, we, there's things we don't like. We don't like digital media. We don't like ad tech or publishing tech, um, but we're generalists and we're looking to fund great people in spaces uh, that they're excited about that get us excited about what they're doing. Um, we don't, um, you know, we like healthcare. We like a slant towards healthcare infrastructure. We like FinTech with a slant towards FinTech infrastructure, but we'll fund consumer healthcare and consumer FinTech as well. Um, we have a site on, we have a, a bucket on our site for climate and synthetic bio. So. Uh, we're totally interested in companies that are, are oriented around uh, how do you feed 12 billion people and uh, how do you sort of think about the world in a, a post-industrial age and uh, things like that. But um, software is the orientation of the firm. Uh, business model is the orientation of the firm. But uh, we, are, we are open to sort of anybody's idea and, and market. Um, Tamal. Hey, David. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, 
really wanted to know, have you ever invested in uh, emerging countries or what's your perspective? Because emerging countries are so behind than US or like, you know, yeah. first world countries. Our, um, our firm is mostly US focused. So we, we funded entrepreneurs uh, from lots of places, but it typically is with a slant towards the US customer. Um, we are a small team of six. We're not a, a big global team. And so we just have to fund what we understand. Um, so we don't fund companies that are doing X for Y country. Uh, it's a it's a sort of a big line in the sand that we draw there. Um, so emerging markets are not something that is a firm we focus on. But, uh, you know, there are plenty of investors out there that definitely do. All right. I'm going to screw up your name, so I don't want to do that. But um, yep. last name, Farrakh. Yep. Uh, Ishfak. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, nice to uh, meet yep. you. Uh, Yep, nice to meet you, David. Uh, thanks for doing this. This is very helpful. I I I'm, uh, actually work at a, a early stage VC firm, so I was just curious to hear your thoughts on how you view early stage investing versus late stage investing. I know you mentioned that you you invested in Estranis, which is a company I'm familiar with actually. So it's it's it's. I would really like to hear your thoughts. How how you evaluate the two? Because there's a lot of differences between early stage and late stage, right? I don't do early, I don't do late stage investing. Um, I don't like late stage investing. That's like a finance job. I'm not in finance. I just, I, I invest in uh, people and their dreams and uh, it's very different. I think, um, you know, there's a lot more uh, data and a lot more uh, sort of analytics that go into late stage investing. It's, um, it's a very different business, I, I think. Uh, our business is um, really oriented around people and um, very much uh, different than a late stage investor. So I don't think about late stage investing all that much. That's my, my quick answer to you. Amanda. Okay, this is actually from a friend of mine who's gonna watch the recording and wasn't able to make it, um, but I think it's really interesting too. So can you talk a bit about the effect that all this venture capital is having on valuations and then the impact that that is having on founder ownership? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a bull market. It is, um, look, it's easy to say that. Uh, I'll, I'll preface it by saying like, when you, when you as a founder hear everybody's raising VC, it's easy to raise money, everybody's raising a crazy valuations and you're not, it sucks. And so, it's not sort of applicable to everybody. So I, I would say that if, if you are a have, it is good right now and you can raise money. Uh, you can raise money at bigger valuations. You can have less dilution. So um, the market's moving very fast. It's the fastest it's ever moved in my 12 years of doing this. Things that used to take months are happening in days now. Um, so uh, it's probably good for founders. It's, it doesn't mean there won't be bad companies. It doesn't mean there won't be stupid investments or uh, sort of explosive declines and things. Um, but I don't know if you're a founder better this than the other side of the, the world. So that's, that's my take. Nas. Are they, why are they going fast? Sorry. There's a lot of money chasing. I mean, look like tech outcomes are, are bigger than they ever have been. And uh, I don't think that's going away. And there's a lot of money chasing these things. I think it low interest rates and there's some macro explanations of this, but uh, there's a lot of money chasing what is in essence big, big opportunities. And so, um, yeah, that's where we're at every day. Cool. Nas. Yeah, I'm, uh, my second question is around valuation. Oh, you already asked the question. Sorry. Rishi, we'll come back to you. Hi, um, Rishi. Just a quick question. Do you have any just kind of general advice on kind of the the very early stages of this, so like the ideation, forming your team, that that kind of stage. Work with people like like the team's the most important. Don't don't work with people because you think they'll be great. Work with people because you want to work with them and uh, find balance. So, what is the risk of the company? If the risk of the company is tech, make sure there's somebody that that is technical on the team. Yeah. If the risk is sales, make sure that there's somebody who's like not just check mark, like what we do when we look at a team, like what is the risk of this business? And is the person who's going to win in that area sitting in the room with us? So three MBAs that are working on something super technical that are not technical, we're out. 
Now, three engineers that need to do an amazing job going to market and selling that don't have a sales bone in their body, we're out. And so figuring out what the core competency is that you need to be great at and building a team around that and then chemistry. I want to know how you met. I want to know your biggest fights. Like, you know, we funded companies to be real, like that have never met each other, that met each other on Zoom and have started on Zoom, but you can tell their chemistry is great. They've done the, the, the requisite work to get the chemistry right. And so um, put in the time and just, just find that right chemistry. Um, and then idea like, I don't know, pick an idea that's right, that, that you're gonna go pursue and, and make real. There's no easy answer there. All right, Nas, back to you. Yeah, I wanted to ask about valuation. How do you go about valuation? Um, since the market dictates valuation. Um, it just so, so do you imagine the future cash flows and then discount it, or how do you go about do, put your how do you go about that? You feel which way the air is blowing. Sorry, I said you put your finger up and you feel which way the air is blowing. I don't. I, I, there is no math at the stage when we invest. I don't know what the future cash flow is. I have no idea what the business is going to be. I have no idea how big it is. I'm, it's pretty binary. These things are going to work or they're not. And we invest with what the market dictates the valuation to be. So we don't, we don't tend to control uh, valuation at the stage where we operate up. All right, Jenna. I'm following Nas's lead, asking a second question as well. Go um, for it. I'm, I'm curious on your, your general VC philosophy of do you invest in one company per specific industry or investing in potentially competitors within the same in industry and, and how you would manage potential conflicts of interest with that? Yeah, we try, we don't, we try not to, and we've never funded direct competitors. Like that's not the goal. Um, we've had companies pivot into being directly competitive with another portfolio company. We can't control that. That's not our sort of, we, we don't have anything to do with that. Um, you control it carefully. We're not, we're not operating. So we're investors. We're, we're not trying to share your information with another company. Um, so you just are, are honest and respectful and uh, build authentic relationships and you tend not to find yourself in trouble. Um, you, know, you have companies that if, if every single thing they say goes right in 15 years, they will compete with each other. That's fine. That that doesn't feel like like if if Roe the consumer um, you know uh, the the vertically integrated uh, primary care platform is the one winner and Maven which is a women's telehealth platform that focuses on employees if they are both successful in fifteen years they probably compete but today they are servicing adjacent areas in a very different way. One's consumer facing, one's B2B, one is focused on women's health, one is focused on the whole stack. So like, can I say they're potentially competitive? Sure, we invested in Roe five years ago, we invested in Maven seven years ago. We're, we're halfway there and they're not competitive. And so uh, I think that's the way that we, we think about uh, spaces. Our, our interest is to back great companies. We are not trying to fund uh, things that we got wrong. If we, if we funded something six years ago and it didn't work, we'll fund it again. Like we probably still like the idea. So I think that's like a, a different side of that answer. Interesting. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Fire away. I think we're out of yeah. time. Any more last minute questions? Thank you guys very much good. for having me. I appreciate it. Everybody stay safe and uh, have a wonderful week and good luck on your virtual finals or whatever it is you all do on the internet now. Thank you very much. Have a Thanks, great David. night. Thanks, Thanks David. David. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Thank you.